Uh, and so, well, by way of introduction, uh, well, let me first of all say what's, what I mean by non relativistic geometry. So, non relativistic geometry, that is in itself a rather old topic. And by non relativistic geometry, I essentially mean a framework of differential geometry in which you replace local Lorentz transformations by some non relativistic equivalents. That can be local Galilean trans transformations, but it can also be something slightly more complicated that contains, for instance, local Galilean transformations. And as I said, in itself, the topic of non relativistic geometry is something uh, rather old already. It was, uh, I think, the first example of non relativistic geometry was introduced by Cartan in a seminal paper in 1916. And he introduced something that we nowadays call torsionless Newton Cartan geometry. Uh, I will explain later what torsionless Newton Cartan geometry is. I will talk a lot about it, in fact. And he used this to formulate something that uh, is called Newton-Cartan gravity. And that's essentially a, a diffeomorphism covariant and geometric formulation of ordinary Newtonian gravity. It's completely equivalent to ordinary Newtonian gravity, but it looks, it doesn't look like ordinary Newtonian gravity. It looks very much like general relativity, like the Einstein equations, for instance. In fact, I mean, from the date 1916, you can clearly see that Cartan was inspired by uh, the advent of general relativity and the role that geometry plays in general relativity. And he asked himself the question, is there a way that geometry can play a similar role in uh, Newtonian gravity? And he answered the question in the affirmative uh, on the condition that you replace the notion of Riemannian or, or Lorentzian geometry by some non-relativistic equivalence, which is uh, nowadays called Newton-Cartan geometry, and more precisely, torsion is Newton-Cartan geometry. So even though this is an old topic, uh, it has seen a revival in recent years, uh, and that revival really comes from uh, the fact that uh, non relativistic geometry started appearing in a lot of uh, applications. So I've written down a list here of applications. Uh, it's a list that you've already seen more or less in the talk by Niels Obers. Um, some of these applications I will briefly say something about later in my talk. Essentially, these applications, they range from uh, non-relativistic gravity or studies of uh, general relativity uh, in the non-relativistic regime to non-relativistic string theory that you will hear about later today uh, to uh, non-relativistic quantum field theory. Essentially, any setting in which you are describing a non-relativistic system, in which you are describing physics that takes place on a non-relativistic space-time, and in which it makes sense to have a decent covariant formulation of the background geometry, is something in which Newton-Cartan geometry appears. That's more or less the gist of it. Now, it was noticed during all these applications that uh, all of these applications require certain generalization or certain extensions of the original torsion as Newton-Cartan geometry that Cartan originally constructed. And for that reason, the past five to ten years have seen essentially a boom or a revival of the old topic of Newton-Cartan geometry or non-relativistic geometry. And one of the lessons that uh, was learned was already something that Niels mentions, that is that the topic of non-relativistic geometry is much more diverse than previously thought. Uh, in a way, you can associate a geometry to any type of non-relativistic non space-time symmetry algebra that you can think of. And that leads to the fact that you can construct a whole zoo of non-relativistic geometries that you can use for certain specific applications. And part of uh, the uh, aim of my talk is to illustrate uh, that phenomenon. So, what are the differences between non relativistic geometry and uh, Lorentzian geometry as you know it from general relativity? Well, you know that in Lorentzian geometry, you have to specify a non degenerate metric structure. And once you specify the metric structure, then the uh, connection structure uh, is essentially determined by the metric. In case you have zero torsion, you can just construct the Levi-Civita connection fully out of the metric. And adding torsion is not so difficult, it's just the tensor that you have to add into the game. Non-relativistic geometry, as you will see in my talk, is a bit more intricate. Uh, first of all, it has a degenerate metric structure. You will see that explicitly in my talk. And uh, one important difference is that the connection structure is usually not fully specified by the metric structure. You need some additional ingredients. Furthermore, torsion also plays a subtly different role in, in non-relativistic geometry. So one of the key messages of my talk is going to be that uh, you need to specify extra ingredients beyond the, metric, beyond the metric structure in order to fully specify the geometry. 
Uh, and in fact, these extra ingredients, they are determined by some of the physics that you want to describe on the geometry. So physics actually plays a bigger role in coming up with the right geometry. If you have a certain application, if you want to describe a certain normativistic system in a diffeomorphism covariant way, so you want to put it on a background geometry uh, and you want to describe the background geometry in a diffeomorphism covariant way, you need to carefully think about the physics that is going on because some of the physics is already going to creep in, into the geometry. Some of the physics that you want to describe already is, is already kind of encoded in the geometry. What I want to do in this talk is to illustrate this. So I was asked to give a review talk, but as you've seen from the long list of applications, uh, there is no way that I can give like a full review of all these applications in one hour. So what I will do instead is uh, give something slightly more pedagogical. I will illustrate these subtleties. So I will illustrate this fact that you need extra ingredients beyond the metric structure in a couple of examples. And what I will do is uh, I will spend quite some time uh, on Cartan's original torsion is Newton Cartan geometry. I will put that in a more modern frame-like formulation. If you read Cartan's original papers, he did it in metric-like formulation. I will do it in a more modern frame-like formulation that is more easily uh, extendable or generalizable to different types of geometry. And I will illustrate these subtleties that I mentioned here. And then I will discuss some of the, generali the generalizations that have appeared in recent applications, namely torsional Newton-Cartan geometry, and to set the stage uh, for the talks by uh, Eric and uh, Johannes uh, later today. Uh, I will also say something about string Newton-Cartan geometry that you have also already uh, encountered in talk by Niels Obers. And if I have enough time, I will just briefly in one slide say something about uh, recent work on non-relativistic supergravity. Okay, that's the plan. So let me start by uh, explaining to you what torsion is Newton-Cartan geometry is. So that's the original geometry constructed by Cartan. And I will do it, as I said, in a Wielbein formulation, in a frame-like formulation. There are many ways to do this, but I will choose the way that is uh, closest to my heart. Uh, namely, I will uh, do it by uh, gauging uh, a normalistic space-time symmetry algebra. The word gauging, you should not take it too literal. Uh, it's not that I'm going to construct the gauge theory. Uh, the only, what I mean by that is very similar to how we can view the Cartan formulation of Lorentzian geometry in GR uh, as a gauging of the Poincaré algebra. And what I mean by that is that if you think about the Cartan formulation of Lorentzian geometry, it consists of a Wielbein and a spin connection. And the, the, the Wielbein and the spin connection, they transform under local Lorentz transformations N. And the transformation rules are essentially determined as gauge transformation rules uh, for the Poincaré algebra. So you can just read them off from the structure constants of the Poincaré algebra. Of course, you're not dealing with ordinary gauge theory because uh, the spin connection omega is not an independent field. It's a dependent field. It's a connection that depends on the field bind. Uh, and you can express this dependence in slightly gauge theoretic language by saying that the spin connection uh, should obey what uh, we usually call a conventional constraints. I've written it down here. That's the usual zero torsion condition uh, in uh, the Cartan formulation of Riemannian geometry. It's essentially saying that uh, the curvature of the field bind uh, is flat. So that the field bind is a flat connection. Um, and uh, so, so what you do is you just construct the gauge covariant field strengths associated to the translation generators and you put it equal to zero. That gives you a set of uh, d squared times d minus one over two equations that you can view as algebraic equations for the spin connection components. There's as many spin connection components uh, as there are equations, and so you can fully solve these equations to uh, express the spin connection in terms of the field by. That's well known. And you can apply the same strategy to non-relativistic space and symmetry algebra. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the Poincaré algebra by non-relativistic space and symmetry algebra, and I'm going to essentially follow this procedure. And you will see that it's slightly more subtle than just this. This is very straightforward, just a reformulation of the usual Cartan formulation. You will see that uh, in the case that you replace uh, your space and symmetry algebra by something non intuitive that it becomes a bit more tricky. And in fact, you will see that you need some extra ingredients. So I will illustrate this procedure uh, to obtain a field by formulation of torsion as Newton-Cartan geometry that already goes back to uh, work, uh, I think, in 85 by uh, uh, Duval, Burdek, Künzler, Perrin, uh, and it was revisited, uh, uh, I think, in 2013 by uh, Roel Andringa, Erik Bershoef, uh, Sudakarpan, and Meestro. Okay, 
the first tricky point points already concerns what the, the choice of uh, correct space time symmetry algebra so naively you would think that's the correct space time symmetry algebra to start from is the Galilei algebra because the Galilei algebra is the C2 infinity limits, the in, is, is an in in Wigner contraction of the Poincare algebra. That would be the very natural choice to start from. In fact, that turns out to be wrong. That turns out to be not a very convenient choice. It turns out that you have to start, or that the best choice uh, to start from is uh, not so much the Galilei algebra, but what is called the Bargman algebra. And the Bargman algebra is uh, a central ex or decentral extension of the Galilei algebra in uh, d dimensions. So you can see that as a Newton-Wigner contraction of the Poincaré algebra plus an extra u1. But it turns out that it's important to include the central extension in order to uh, make the, the, the gauging procedure smooth. And you will see, once I've done it, why it's important to include the central charge. So what I will do is I will start from the Bargman algebra that cons that's, uh, consists of uh, time translation H, spatial translations PA, spatial rotations JAB, Galilean boosts GA, and a central charge M. The central charge pops up in the commutator between boosts and translations. And the index uh, small AB uh, runs from one to D minus one, so it's a purely spatial index. And then I will just Take the Bargman algebra, and I will uh, associate a gauge field to every generator of this. So the, to the time translations, I associate a gauge field uh, tau, that I will refer to as the time-like field bind. To the spatial translations, I associate a gauge, a gauge field uh, E, that I will refer to as the spatial field bind. And then you have uh, a central charge gauge field M that is associated to the central charge. And then you have two connections, two spin connections, one that is associated to uh, the rotations and one that is associated to the boosts. And I will call these rotation connection and the boost connection. Once you've made that association, you can write down gauge transformation rules. You just look at the structure constants of the Bargman algebra and you write down, yeah, uh, yes. Just to clarify the method a little bit, I, you were referring to uh, Chamsuddin and West. Yeah. It goes back to McDowell and Mansouri. Okay. And it was, uh, it's the kind of, just to remind people what was going on, that this is the sort of construction which was used in conform, constructing conformal supergravity. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank Indeed, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good remark. Yeah. So what you can do is you can uh, just write down the transformation rules under uh, local boosts, whose parameter I denote by lambda A, local spatial rotations, whose parameter I denote by lambda AB, and the central charge, whose parameter I denote by sigma, for all of these gauge fields. They just follow from the Bargman algebra. You just read them off from the structure constants. So just to point out, uh, the interesting part is always the boost in this game. That's always a non-trivial part. So you see, for instance, that the spatial view bind transforms under boost to the time-like view bind, but not vice versa. So the time-like view bind does not transform to the spatial view bind. That's where the Lorentz transformations are broken to Galilei transformations. And moreover, the uh, central charge gauge field also transforms under boosts to the uh, spatial field bind. And then you have two transformation rules for the spin connection. Uh, from the names that I give to this field, it should be obvious that I want to interpret tau and e as some field bind structure for a metric structure, and that I want to interpret the omegas as some connection structure uh, on a manifold. So the first thing that I can already do is uh, clarify how the field binds are related to some metric structure. Uh, so the first thing that's, that I will do in order to do that is define inverse field bind, uh, inverse in quotes, because of course, I mean, tau is, a, is just a, it's a one form, so it's not something that you can invert. And the e mu a, the spatial field bind is also not, an, uh, not a square matrix because the a index is only a spatial index, while the mu is a full space time index. Nevertheless, what you can do is you can define an uh, object tau with an upper index and an uh, object e with an upper index, 
you can define them in this way. Essentially, what you do here is you uh, construct a square matrix out of uh, where you put the tau mu in, in uh, the first column and then the e mu a's in the other columns. And you have a square matrix. You can invert it and you can then read off tau with an upper index and uh, e with an upper index. From this view by an inverse view by you can then construct metrics or a metric, metric or a matrix. You do it like in uh, Lorentzian geometry. So what you do is you construct something that is quadratic in the view binary or the inverse view binary, and that is in the case of Lorentzian geometry invariant under local Lorentz transformations. Here you look for invariants that are quadratic in uh, tau and e and their inverses that are invariant under local boosts and local spatial rotations. And there are two such invariants that you can construct. So there's one tau mu nu that is just a tensor product of tau with itself. That's a covariance symmetric two tensor of rank one. And you can interpret that as a time-like metric. It's a metric that you can use to uh, measure uh, time-like distances on your manifolds. Then out of the inverse spatial field binary, you can construct uh, a metric h mu nu with upper indices. That is a contravariance symmetric two tensor of rank d minus one. You can interpret that as a space-like metric. So it's something that you can measure, that you can use to measure spatial distances. And these two metrics are mutually orthogonal by definition of uh, the way in which I defined the inverse field binary. So what you see here is that instead of a non-degenerate metric, you have a degenerate metric structure. You have two degenerate metrics. And you clearly see that uh, the whole normativistic time-space splits that you should have on something that you can reasonably call a normativistic manifold is implemented geometrically here by this, de by this, de by this degenerate metric structure. So that is basically how Newton-Cartan normativistic geometry implements the normativistic character of the space or one of the ways in which it does that. That's the metric structure. If you want to talk about geometry, you also want to talk about parallel transports, so you need a connection. So what I want to do now is to uh, use these connections to omega, this uh, rotation connection and boost connection to build up a connection structure on my manifold. So I want to interpret these as spin connections that are not independent, but that depend on the view binary tau E and N. So I want to make them independent. And you can do that just like in the Poincaré case. Uh, in the Poincaré case, you uh, do it by uh, putting a curvature constraint on one of the covariant curvatures associated with the Poincaré algebra. I've written down all the covariant field strengths of the Bargman algebra here. Uh, you have to uh, put constraints such that you can solve for the spin connections. So uh, what you want to do is you put, want to put constraints on uh, the curvatures that involve the spin connections algebraically. There's two of them. One, the one that is associated to the spatial translations. Uh, and the one that is associated to the central charge. That's why you need to include the central charge. Yes? Just one question. Uh, so you said you have two metrics, right? One has rank one, one has rank R yeah. min uh, D minus one, yes. and they are orthogonal to each yes, other. Yeah. Can one put them together to make one object? Yes, that's of course against the spirit of uh, of non-statistic geometry. Oh, okay, but I mean, uh, in principle, you could define an object that contains them both, and it's uh, and it's invertible, I guess. I mean, if you think of them as two project, sort of two projectors, kind of thing. Well, well um, you can do something, uh, but it, it's so so. Okay, the one thing that you have to keep in mind is that the index structure is different here. So so tau has an, uh, has a lower has lower indices, h has upper indices. Okay. So you, you cannot straightforwardly add them. Okay, okay. There's something that you can do if you play with the central charge gauge fields uh, to make it to, to get something boost invariant. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 these are really the metrics that have the physical interpretation of measuring distances, and they, you cannot straightforwardly add them because they have a different index structure. Okay, okay, okay. You, you see why I asked the question. I mean, it seemed like. And I, I didn't think it would be degenerate because one has rank one, one has d minus one, they're orthogonal, feels like two projectors. Yeah, yeah, in the wrong place, that I understand. Okay, okay. 
So what I will do is, uh, in order to uh, fully, well, to specify my connection structure, I will impose conventional constraints, zero torsion conditions, if you want, by putting the curvature associated to translations equal to zero, and the curvature associated to the central charge equal to zero. And then you can do the bookkeeping, you can do the counting, and you can uh, count the number of equations that you have here. There's d squared times d minus one over two. You can count the number of uh, components in the spin connections, omega mu a, b, and omega mu a. There's d squared times d minus one uh, uh, over two. So you have as many equations uh, as you have uh, components in the spin connections. You can solve the spin connections fully in terms of uh, the field binary tau e and also the central charge gauge field. So the central charge gauge field also sits in there. And you get some uh, expressions for the spin connections in terms of these three fields. Uh, I haven't written them down, they're not uh, particularly enlightening. There is another one subtlety, and that's important. And that, is, uh, that has to do with the fact that uh, you, have to be, you have to carefully distinguish between uh, the spin connections before. Uh, you express them in terms of the field binder and the M fields and the spin connections that are dependent expressions. Um, so I mean that um, before you solve these conventional constraints, you can, the spin connections have certain transformation rules that you read off from the Bargman algebra. So they are these transformation rules that I've written down here. When I write on these transformation rules, in principle, I view the spin connections still as independent fields. However, once you solve for the spin connections, the spin connections are expressions in terms of tau E and M. So the boost transformation rules and the spatial rotation transformation rules are induced by the transformation rules of tau E and M. In the Poincaré case, the transformation rule of the dependent spin connection coincides with the usual one that you get from uh, the Poincaré algebra. Here, that's no longer the case. That's a subtlety. If you do the computation, so if you uh, calculate, for instance, the boost transformation rule of the boost connection that depends on tau E and M, then you will see that it contains terms that are given by the Bargman algebra, plus some extra terms that involve R of H, and R of H is uh, the curvature associated to time translations, or in other words, the curl of tau, right? The reason why that happens is that uh, the set of conventional constraints that I have imposed is not invariant under boosts, at least it's not invariant under the boost transformations where you view the spin connections as independent fields. All spin constraints under boosts where I view the spin connections as independent fields goes to the R of P constraint, but the R of P constraints is not invariant. That's under boosts, R of P under boost goes to R of H, to the curl of tau. That's the reason why this happens. And that's a subtle difference with uh, uh, the standard Cartan formulation of uh, Lorentz in geometry. Nevertheless, at this point, you could not care about it, and you could just say, like, okay, uh, we have a spin connection. Uh, at least it transforms as a connection, so it has a, a D lambda term. That's the thing that you really want. And these extra terms, uh, well, why care about them? But what you also want to do is, of course, introduce an affine connection. Once you have spin connections, you can introduce an affine connection, and you do that via Wielbein postulates. So you impose Wielbein postulates uh, just like you would do it uh, in GR. Um, and uh, from these Wielbein postulates, uh, you can uh, just fully solve for the affine connection gamma. Uh, the spin connections are now solved in terms of tau E and M, and uh, you can just use these spin connections, these uh, Wielbein postulates to fully solve gamma in terms of tau E and M, and then you can also show that you can, that you can uh, write them in terms of these two uh, um, degenerate metrics and the M field. Uh, however, what you want for an affine connection is that it's invariant under local uh, rotations and local boosts. Local rotations, that's not a problem. Uh, but the affine connection that you define in this way via the Wielbein postulates is only invariant under local boosts, provided the spin connections transform according to the transformation rule of the Bargman algebra. So in other words, uh, the affine connection is only invariant under boosts, provided these extra terms here are absent. So in order to, be, to have an affine connection that is uh, invariant under boosts, you need to impose the constraints that the curl of tau is equal to zero. Uh, 
Um, and I will call that the absolute time foliation constraint. Uh, that's an extra constraint that appears in uh, proportionless Newton Cartan geometry. If you look at this constraint, that's uh, essentially a foliation constraint. Uh, it's stronger than a foliation constraint, in fact. So it tells you that your manifold that you're uh, dealing with is foliated uh, in terms of uh, you know, D minus one dimensional space like leaves and then an extra time direction. So the, yeah, we'll come back to that. Nevertheless, once you've defined this affine connection, then you're in business because the affine connection is by construction metric compatible. It's also torsionless. But note that it contains, it does not only depend on the metrics, it contains an extra field, namely the central charge gauge field. That's the extra structure that you need to specify. Once you have the affine connection, you can construct curvature tensors as usual. Uh, you can do, construct the Riemann tensor and the Ricci tensor. Uh, usually you don't really define a, a, a Ricci scalar because you need an inverse metric for that. So let me say something about the physical interpretation of this extra constraint here. Uh, it's already contained in the name that I gave to it, absolute time foliation constraint. Uh, essentially, this constraint is a nice covariant way of uh, saying that your manifold has a notion of absolute time. Uh, in particular, what you can do is you can define the time interval delta t that is measured by an observer that moves along a certain road line c between two events, simply as the integral of the um, time-like view line or, or the, the tau one form along the world line. And then if you have two observers that move along two different world lines with the same initial and final events, um, you can compare their time inter the, the time intervals that, that they measure if there's a notion of absolute time, they should agree on the time intervals. The time intervals should be the same if they uh, are between the same initial and final events. So these two integrals should be the same, and that holds true even only if uh, tau is a closed one form. The uh, closure of tau, the absolute time foliation constraint, is nothing but implementing the notion of absolute time, as you know it from Newtonian physics, in a covariant way. Also note that, um, or what I'm going to say later in my talk, uh, I will want to evade this constraint. If you evade this constraint, that means that you introduce torsion, right? You can just take the first field and postulate and to symmetrize it in the mu nu indices. And then you see that if the curl of tau is non-zero, then it means that there's some non-zero torsion. It also means that Imposing zero tor torsion, that, in, that means that you impose uh, some constraint on the metric structure. That's very different from ordinary Riemannian geometry. Imposing zero torsion in Riemannian ge geometry, that's not imposing any constraint on the metric at all. So this is a, a crucial difference with Riemannian geometry. I mentioned this later because uh, in a couple of minutes I will start talking about uh, uh, torsion for newton cartan geometry. So what's the picture that you have now? The geometry is not fully specified. What's the picture that you have? You have some manifolds, some space time that is foliated in space like leaves that are D minus one dimensional. There's a metric H mu with upper indices that you can use to measure distances on these space like leaves. And then there's an uh, absolute time direction orthogonal to it that is uh, absolute in case uh, the curl of tau is equal to zero in the sense that uh, different observers will agree on time intervals between uh, events. And you can measure time uh, distances uh, using uh, a time-like metric tau mu. So as I already mentioned, it's important to include this extra central charge gauge fields. If I would not have included it, and if, if I would have started from the Galilei algebra, I would have only been able to uh, build up one conventional constraint, and I would not have enough equations to fully solve for the spin connections. So it means that, in fact, d, d times d minus 1 over two components of the spin connections would have remained independent. By including the central charge gauge fields, uh, I express these d times d minus 1 over two independent uh, components in terms of uh, the end field, the central charge gauge field. A priori, you might not care about that because it seems a bit like, well, you still have to introduce an extra ingredients. Uh, but it is important to point out that the central charge gauge field has a very physical interpretation. The central charge M that you include in the Bargman algebra, that's the, side, that's the neutral charge that is associated to mass conservation. 
So in non-relativistic theories, mass conservation is something different from energy conservation. So there's a neutral charge associated to it that is a separate ingredient. And it is essentially the central charge that you can add to the Galilei algebra. Uh, if you think about massive fields, massive fields are non-trivially charged under this central charge. So, so they are essentially fields that pick up some phase factor uh, under uh, a U1 associated to the central charge. So that means that if you want to couple massive matter fields to a curved non-relativistic background, to a curved torsionless newton cartan background, uh, then you need to do it by a minimal coupling with this extra and new field. So you need to replace derivatives by uh, derivatives that are covariant with respect to mu. And in fact, I should have uh, also replaced uh, um, partial mu also by a fully uh, diffeomorphism covariant derivative. So mu, the central charge gauge fields, physically is uh, the uh, a gauge field that couples to a current that is associated to mass conservation. It is really a geometric field. Uh, it appears in the connection. It specifies the connection. It transforms in the local boosts. Uh, and so, well, I haven't, um, I haven't said anything about Newton-Cartan gravity. I briefly mentioned it, but it does turn out that in Newton-Cartan gravity, so this diffeomorphism covariant formulation of Newtonian gravity that is based on torsion is Newton-Cartan geometry. It turns out that uh, the Newton potential, so non-relativistic gravity itself, is contained in the central charge gauge fields. The geometry is trivial in, in Newton-Cartan gravity. The geometry is just flat Euclidean uh, geometry. The Newton potential itself sits in the a new field. So from this, you can basically extract the main message that I want to convey. And that is that, uh, first of all, typically, when you want to construct non-relativistic geometry uh, by gauging some non-relativistic uh, symmetry algebra, then typically gauging the naive symmetry algebra, in this case, the Galilei algebra, is not enough to fully specify the, geom the geometry. You need some extra ingredients. And in this case, the extra ingre ingredient is this MU field. You need them to fully specify the connection structure. In this case, this MU field can be interpreted algebraically. You can interpret it as a central charge or as being associated to a central charge. That does not always have to be the case. There are other types of non lorentzian geometry. So for instance, Carroll geometry, where you also need uh, extra ingredients to, to specify the connection structure. In those cases, uh, you cannot really interpret them uh, uh, algebraically. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my, I have a question regarding the central charge, right? So I understand that you need the central charge uh, that plays indeed the role of a yuan that gives you this conservation of mass, which is separate from the conservation of energy. Very good. Now, if um, I wanted to see this newton cartan geometry and the whole structure which is behind as a limit of uh, Poincaré, mm -hmm. uh, then I would have Indeed, introducing Poincaré, yes, uh, an extra current, right? Yes, yeah. So you uh, you said it in the beginning that you were actually starting from Poincaré, centrally extended. Yes. That's what you are doing, right? Yes. So, but then you need in that case, in, in that case, well, it is geometric, but maybe not completely geometric. Not as geometric as it is here, probably. Um, well, you can do it. Uh, I will just give a very brief answer because I think Eric will uh, will come back to it. So, so what you can do is you can add an extra field um, in GR, uh, an extra one form field, and um, you can impose a constraint of it on it, namely that it's a flat connection, so that you don't introduce extra degrees of freedom. It's a bit artificial, uh, if I say it like that, but. So, you can do it like that. And then you can use this extra field to take the limit in a proper way. But I think Eric will come back to that. So you also clearly see that some of the physics that you want to describe, some of the moment physics that you want to describe, so in this case, mass conservation is encoded geometrically. It's encoded in the connection that you put on the manifold via the central charge gauge field. I should also mention that there are other roads to Newton Cartan geometry. You can obtain it via dimensional reduction along a null isometry. Uh, that's essentially because the little group of a null killing vector uh, or of a null vector is the Bargmal algebra. Uh, and uh, you can also obtain it via non-activistic limits, uh, as uh, uh, was just asked, but uh, Eric will say more about that. Yeah. 
Okay, that's the torsion is Newton Cartan geometry according to Cartan. What I want to do in the rest of my talk is uh, describe two generalizations of it that have, that have been important uh, for recent applications. And the first generalization has to do with including torsion. So why would you want to include torsion? Well, if you think about uh, the applications in which um, Newton Cartan geometry appeared, it's not too difficult to see that this framework that Cartan constructed of zero torsion Newton Cartan geometry is too restricted. So for instance, if you want to use Newton Cartan geometry to study non altruistic quantum field theory, uh, you can, for instance, uh, try to study transport properties in, in some effective field theory by coupling your non relativistic quantum field theory to an arbitrary curved background. And then if you do that, uh, you can uh, compute uh, currents, energy momentum and mass currents, uh, basically by viewing the time-like field bind, the spatial field bind, and the, the central charge gate fields as sources for these currents. Uh, that's something that has been uh, used a lot in, in work by people like Damson and so on, where they had some certain effective field theories for the fractional quantum Hall effect. And then the, they used the whole formalism of Newton Cartan geometry to construct the effective field theories, but also to really compute currents and then uh, compute uh, transport properties. Now, if you want to compute currents in this way, then uh, it is quite important to have arbitrary backgrounds. You don't want the constraint on one of the, the, the fields that acts as a source for the current. Another setting in which you perhaps can see more clearly that you uh, that it's important sometimes to evade this uh, absolute time foliation constraints, that's holography for non relativistic CFTs. So this is this is this Lifshitz uh, holography. So that's essentially a version of holography uh, where you replace the ADS spacetime by something else that is called the Lifshitz spacetime. Those are spacetimes that are uh, relativistic spacetimes uh, in the book. But they have a notion of boundary, of conformal boundary. And this notion of conformal boundary is such that uh, as you approach the boundary, the local light cones, they start opening up. And uh, it's a, it is as if uh, the speed of light goes to infinity. So you get uh, at the boundary, you get like lo uh, local light cones that, are, uh, that exhibit a non relativistic causal structure. Uh, like C is going to, to infinity at the boundary. So that means essentially that the local, local, the local Lorentz symmetry that you have in the bulk of these Lipschitz spacetimes degenerates into uh, local Galilean symmetry at the boundary. So that's already a very strong hint that the boundary geometry in Lipschitz space in Lipschitz holography is Newton Cartan, uh, and that's indeed true. Now you're dealing with holography, so the boundary metric is only determined up to local wild scalings. In this case, uh, it's up to anisotropic wild scalings. So there's some dynamical exponent Z that can appear in there. Uh, but in particular, the uh, time like real bind tau is only determined up to anisotropic wild scalings, and that's incompatible with the curl of tau being zero. So this constraint, the absolute time foliation constraint is not invariant under local wild scalings. So it means that uh, Newton Cartan space times that appear in holography for non relativistic CFTs, they cannot be torsionless Newton Cartan space times. It's also important when you study GR uh, in the large C strong gravity regime. There's also been a lot of work uh, recently on that. Uh, also, there it's important to evade the um, absolute time foliation constraints. Essentially, uh, this deals with some kind of large C expansion of general relativity, and it turns out that you can still capture some typical strong gravity uh, effects. In particular, you can, ex you can uh, capture a notion of time dilation uh, in the large C expansion of GR. And time dilation is, of course, incompatible with having an absolute time. So that's also a setting in which you want to evade this constraint. Now, as I said, Having the curl of tau equal to zero, that means, uh, or evading the curl of tau equal to zero, that means introducing torsion. So that leads to torsional Newton Cartan geometry. And uh, the way to do it in the framework, the field by formulation that I've given, is essentially by also including torsion tensors in the conventional constraints. Uh, so you have to put the R of P uh, curvature equal to some torsion tensor T A mu nu, and the R of M uh, curvature you have to put it equal to some torsion tensor T mu nu. Uh, and it's important that these torsion tensors have particular boost transformation rules. So these torsion tensors have to have uh, particular boost transformation rules in order to include um, the torsion or in order to be able to evade the 
uh, absolute time formation constraint. In particular, the T, const the, the T torsion tensor has to transform to the TA torsion tensor. So that's under boosts where you view the spin connections as independent fields, the R of N equal to T constraints goes to the R of P equal to TA constraint. And you also have to require that the uh, TA torsion tensor under boost transforms to lambda A times uh, the curl of tau. If you do that, then the R of P equal to TA constraint under uh, the boost transformation rules that are dictated by the Bargman algebra transforms to an identity. So it literally transforms to lambda R of H is equal to lambda R of H. That's an identity, that's no longer a constraint. So in this way, you evade this uh, phenomenon that the constraints that you uh, impose in order to solve for the spin connections are not invariant under boosts. By adding torsion tensors that transform in a particular way under boosts, you do get a set of constraints that is invariant under boosts that you can solve for the spin connections. The spin connections, the solutions for the spin connections will have the usual transformation rule under boost that is dictated by the Bargman algebra. And that means that the affine connection that you introduce via Wilbein postulates will also be boost invariant. That's the gist of it. Uh, just to point out how this includes or how this um, occurs in, uh, in this Lifshitz holography business. Well, I already met, uh, mentioned that in Lifshitz holography, uh, you have local wire scalings, uh, and that uh, local wire scalings are incompatible with having the absolute uh, time foliation constraint. In fact, the fact that you have a zero, non-zero curl of tau has a nice uh, interpretation because some of the components of the uh, non-zero curl of tau, they give rise to a dependent dilatation gauge fields. So some of the components uh, transform under uh, local wire scalings as a gauge field for dilatation, so with the derivative of the uh, dilatation parameter. And you need them in order to be able to uh, uh, make the, the boundary theory while invariance, to, to achieve while invariance of the boundary theory. In this Lifshitz holography business, um, you usually don't have like independent torsion tensors. The torsion tensors are fully specified by uh, the fields that you have present at the boundary geometric fields that you have present at the boundary or fields that correspond to boundary values of other bulk fields that are present in your theory. Uh, and so, for instance, what you can do is, uh, if you just consider the Newton-Cartan geometric fields, E, tau, and M, you can construct torsion tensors T and TA that have precisely these boost transformation rules here. Uh, this is just one example. This is not unique. You can construct other examples. But the point is that these torsion tensors here have precisely the required boost transformation rules in order to construct a nice uh, torsion full uh, boost invariant spin connection. What you do see is that the expressions that I write down here, they uh, depend on the central charge gauge field explicitly. So uh, the central charge gauge field appears in here without, uh, not in a curl. So that does mean that if you use these torsion tensors to construct torsion full connections, then uh, you get boost invariant connections, but these boost invariant connections are not central charge invariant. And that was something that's, that's a phenomenon that typically happens in this Lipschitz holography. So you can construct nice torsion full boost invariant connections, uh, but they are not central charge uh, invariant. So if you uh, want to keep the central charge, then you have to arrange, uh, or you have to obtain a central charge invariance of your theory in a slightly different way. Okay, how much time do we have? Okay, the second generalization that I want to uh, discuss is uh, string newton cartan geometry. You've already heard about that in the talk by Niels Obers, and you will hear uh, much more about it uh, in the talks by uh, Eric and Johannes uh, later. The only thing that I want to mention is that string newton cartan geometry uh, is also something that fits very nicely uh, in, in, this, in, in what I just said, namely that in order to construct a non-relativistic geometry, you need some extra ingredients. That's the main point that I want to make, and then Eric and Johannes will tell you more about uh, how string newton cartan geometry precisely appear in uh, uh, you know, uh, non-relativistic string theory uh, and supergravity. String Newton Cartan geometry is a type of non-relativistic geometry that appears when you discuss non-relativistic string theory. And uh, Niels Obers has already done a great job uh, motivating non-relativistic string theory uh, using the Bronstein cube. Uh, so uh, 
I don't think I will have to do it. I do want to give some background information uh, on non-relativistic string theory. So as Niels already mentioned, non-relativistic string theory was something that was constructed uh, already a while ago, I think in 2000 or 2001, uh, by Gomis and Oguri and uh, Danielson, uh, Guyosa and Kruczynski. Uh, you have to be a bit careful with the word non-relativistic. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's essentially correspond to certain limits of standard relativistic string theory. So what you can do is you can consider standard relativistic string theory. So I've written here uh, the world sheet action. The MN indices are uh, space-time indices. You can just, just take the string world sheet action. What you can then do is you can consider a specific background fields, so, so specific target space, uh, specific values for the target space fields, uh, G and B for the metric, the target space metric and the B field. In particular, uh, you can split up the index M and N in mu and nu that are uh, that take two values, zero and one, so it contain a time direction and then one extra spatial direction, and then IJ indices that uh, run over uh, the other directions. So what you can do is you can consider this action, this uh, string theory action. You can take G mu nu to be equal to uh, eta mu nu, standard Minkowski metric, and G ij to be equal to delta ij, Kronecker delta times alpha prime divided by some alpha prime effective to have something dimensionless here. Similarly, the B field, you can take it to be non-zero but constants only along the zero one directions. So you can introduce a B field uh, that is, uh, constants along the zero one directions in this way. And then you can also take uh, the string coupling constant to be defined in this way. So what the gomis Ogori non-relativistic string theory corresponds to is considering the string in this background, taking X1 to be compact and taking the alpha prime to zero limit. Right? You have to take this limit a bit carefully. So, so, so it's not as simple as, as just you know, plugging in these background values and then taking alpha prime to zero. You have to introduce Lagrange multipliers and so on and so on to take it carefully. But if you do it, you get some sigma model. You can, you can obtain some sigma model. And I think Johannes will show it in his talk. You can quantize the sigma model. Uh, it's not a sigma model in a relativistic target space time, because if you quantize it, you see that the spectrum of a closed winding string has non-relativistic dispersion relations. That's why it's called non-relativistic string theory, because the, disp the, the spectrum is non-relativistic. It's a fully consistent string theory. Uh, it has all the nice properties that you want, um, UV completeness, etc. Uh, and also prime effective and uh, G here that I introduced, they correspond to the effective string scale and uh, the effective uh, string coupling constant in this theory, right? Now, what I've explained here, that is how you take the limit from relativistic string theory to this gomis ogori string, and then you get something that you can consider as a non-relativistic string in some non-Lorentzian flat background. And then it's, of course, a natural question. What is the curved target space analog, analog of these uh, flat backgrounds? And that's something that a lot of work has appeared on uh, in recent years, and Niels already mentioned something, uh, or some, some of this work in his talk. Uh, I just briefly want to describe the geometry here that you get. You can already kind of see by the way in which I take the limit that you single out two extra directions. So, so instead of singling out uh, one time direction in ordinary newton cartan geometry, here you single out two directions that correspond to the world sheets directions of the string. So essentially what you do here is uh, instead of uh, having like a time space split as in ordinary newton cartan geometry, you implement something like a world sheet transverse space split. So you have a different foliation structure. Instead of having, having like a foliation in terms of D minus one dimensional space-like leaves, you have some, you have a foliation in terms of D minus two dimensional space-like leaves, and then some sort of uh, world sheet directions for, uh, that, uh, that the normal six thing is moving along. Uh, but you can nevertheless build up the geometry very much in the same spirit as what I've explained for Newton-Cartan geometry. Uh, so instead of a time-like view by tau here, now you introduce a longitudinal view bind. Thank you. So, so you add two extra, you, you, add, you uh, introduce a longitudinal view bind uh, with an extra index A that lies along the bullshit directions. 
And then instead of a spatial field point, you have a transverse field point that has an index A prime that lies along the uh, transverse directions. You can introduce uh, inverse view bind. Uh, you can use this inverse view bind uh, to construct metrics and so on. Uh, instead of um, local Galilean boosts uh, and uh, local spatial rotations, you now have like uh, longitudinal S1,1 uh, Lorentz transformations under which uh, the Tom UA view bind transforms as doublets. You have um, transversal SOD minus two rotations under which the uh, the emu a prime deal bind transforms and then you have string galilean boosts uh, that have an index a and a prime under which the e view bind goes to the total view bind so it's very analogous to uh, standard newton cartan geometry uh, these transformation rules they follow from some algebra that i call the string galilee algebra that uh, uh, follows from uh, an inner contraction of the poincare algebra you can also introduce spin connections that are associated to these longitudinal Lorentz transformations, string Galilean boosts and transverse rotations. We have some transformation rules that you can read off from the string Galilei algebra. And then you can try to uh, figure out what these spin connections are as dependent fields by imposing constraints. You just look at the string Galilei algebra, you try to gauge it, you try to uh, impose conventional constraints based on this gauging then uh, you will find that there's only two conventional constraints that you can impose, namely some curvature uh, that is using some curvature that is associated to the uh, longitudinal translation. So there is essentially some covariant curl of the tau field bind, and then a curvature that is some covariant curl of the E field bind. But if you do that, and if you try to solve for the spin connections, then you will find that you don't get enough equations to express all components of the spin connections in terms of uh, the field bind. Just like when you don't include the central charge gauge fields um, in the gauging of the Galilei algebra, you don't have enough uh, constraints to solve for the spin connections in Newton Cartan geometry. You need these extra MU fields. So here you also need an analog of the MU field. And what is very nice, and what Niels also already mentioned in his talk, is that you get it for free when you discuss string theory, is the B-field. It's the Kalpramon B-field. And Niels mentioned that uh, um, that's a very natural analog of the uh, central charge gauge fields, because the central charge gauge field in Newton-Cartan geometry couples to mass currents, while the B-field couples to the tension current. Indeed, as uh, Eric and Johannes will uh, explain to you, the B-field is really a geometric field because it does turn out to transform under uh, uh, local string Galilean boosts. So you should really properly view it as a geometric field and it creeps into the connection structure. So you can use the B-field to define or to specify the spin connections or at least the parts of it are, that are relevant um, only in terms of the field bind structure and the B-field. Um, here, I, I will just briefly, the first point is just, uh, that's something that I think Eric and uh, uh, Johannes will mention. You can also nicely see this from the stigma model action uh, for an omnitivistic string in an arbitrary curve into Cartan background. As Niels already mentioned, you can also uh, obtain, you can also interpret, uh, you can also obtain this geometric interpretation, interpretation of the B fields from gauging suitable extensions of the, of the string Galilei algebra. You can obtain it from relativistic limits, as Eric and Johannes will mention. And I should also mention that uh, you can also uh, look at relativistic strings uh, in torsional standard Newton Cartan backgrounds that's obtained via null reduction of relativistic strings. And in fact, these are also related to this uh, Gomis Okuri string uh, in the string Newton Cartan geometries. And as you heard in a talk by Kevin Moran uh, yesterday, there is a relation between string newton Cartan geometry and double field theory. Okay, since I'm running out of time, I will uh, not say anything about non relativistic supergravity, but feel free to uh, uh, bother me uh, during uh, the coffee break and, uh, and the boat trip. Yeah, I have conclusions. <laughs> so let me maybe use that one minute to conclude. Uh, so I try to convey to you that uh, non-atavistic Newton-Cartan type geometries are uh, very natural geometries whenever you want to discuss non-atavistic UFT, non-atavistic gravity, GR in the non-atavistic regime, non-atavistic string theory, etc. They appear in a variety of contexts. Of context. uh, but it is a bit more standard than 
standard relativistic Riemannian geometry, as you know, it's uh, from GR. So I try to show a bit of these uh, subtleties that can appear that you have to take into account. And what is actually kind of nice is that these subtleties are usually uh, related to some of the physics. So usually in order to solve these subtleties, you have to think carefully about the physics of the application that you want to use the geometry for. Uh, because it's quite likely that some of this physics are, is going to creep into the geometry. Monotheistic geometry is also much more diverse. Diverse. Uh, so I, uh, I've shown you uh, torsion less Newton Cartan geometry, torsion full Newton Cartan geometry, sing Newton Cartan geometry. But in the meantime, there's much more than that. In particular, it turns out that uh, if you study uh, GR in the monotheistic regime and you try to develop some large C expansion of GR, then uh, that can be done in terms of a version of torsional Newton Cartan geometry. That is not the one that I mentioned, but that is called type 2 torsional Newton Cartan geometry that includes extra geometric fields uh, other than MU. And that's work by uh, Niels and collaborators. It's also part of a much wider framework of non Lorentzian geometry in general. I focused here on uh, non relativistic geometry, but you could also consider ultra relativistic geometry. Uh, that's relevant to describe alternativistic physics or physics of null hypersurfaces, for instance. And there has been a lot of work on that uh, in recent years, also, for instance, by Marius. Uh, there's also some relations to flat space holography and so on uh, with that. And that can also, you, you can also just start from, you know, alternativistic symmetry algebras to uh, construct uh, alternativistic geometries. And as an outlook, well, there's plenty of things to, to do. Uh, there's plenty more uh, non relativistic geometry fun uh, to have and uh, to come in uh, the upcoming years. I mentioned a couple of things, uh, uh, but I think it's quite fair to say that the total thoughts are probably the most uh, relevant there because who knows what the future will have. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, it was very nice and clear re review. Uh, we have time for questions. It was a very nice uh, talk. It contains a lot of new information about non relativistic models. Um, I'm, I just have a very naive physics question. You know, the um, the um, equivalence principle is well tested in uh, experiments even quantum experiments yeah and uh, so so at that end g we think of gr as the model and then the mechanics we learn at school at school or university that end is also well tested can you think of an experiment where which would need one of the so, sort of intermediate mod, non relativistic models and to be described. That's the equivalence principle. Um, For example, but you just the, just an experiment where you would see the effects, where you would need the non-relativistic uh, gravity, for example, to uh, describe it. Well, Not, not, not immediately. Um, so th there is some hope, or there could be some hope that uh, you could use, for instance, these expansions of GR in the large C regime um, to uh, well to to to, to study. Um, to study things, for instance, like gravitational wave production. Um, around, uh, I don't know, I mean, binary black holes or something like that. Uh, in a regime where you can uh, still do some sort of analytical calculations, uh, where it could be useful, where, where, where it becomes numerically too intense. Uh, but uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, how much of this hope uh, is, has been realized uh, at this point. We've all seen the gravitational wave pro profiles, and you have this ring on phase and so on. But there should be some regime where, where, uh, where you can effectively uh, treat, uh, where the large C regime could be useful, and where it's may, may be useful to, to use these large C expansions. 
to do some uh, calculations in an analytical way where you could evade uh, large numerical calculations that are uh, um, not very economical in terms of computer time or so. That's something that I can uh, think of right now, but I, uh, yeah, I haven't really thought about uh, concrete experiments to test things like the equivalence principle or something like that, so where uh, non relativistic gravity itself could be useful. It's a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, I, I know, for instance, in, in Vienna um, and also in Stockholm, I think uh, people are very busy thinking about. Um, I think there are a lot of experiments now where. Um, People are able to um, put objects uh, into superposition that have uh, pretty big masses. Uh, so in particular in Vienna, um, they are getting uh, almost close to almost nanometer scale, I think. Um, so, so people are really able to uh, put two masses that are of nanometer size, uh, that are of nanometer scale size into superposition. And their hope is really to uh, to um, to really test, um, you know, essentially quantum effects of gravity, or really to test whether gravity needs to be quantized, yes or no. That's something that fully takes place in, in a non-relativistic regime. So perhaps that's an, that's that's a reg that, that's uh, something where non-relativistic gravity, uh, newton cartan type gravity, could play a role. But I haven't really thought about. Uh, what Interesting. It Thank you. Right in view of time, I would suggest that we move further questions to the coffee break, and let's thank Jan. Our uh, next speaker is going to be Niccolo Cribiori, and is going to speak about uh, the Sitter with Gravitino and the Swarm Plan. Again, Niccolo Cribiori on the sitter with Gravitino and the Swarm Blend. Yes? Okay. So, okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers. It's uh, my pleasure to, to be here and to also to to be here in person. So in the following, I will talk about recent work based on two papers. One which I've done in collaboration with John Guido Dallacada and Fotis Faracos in Padova, and the other one in collaboration with Dieter Lust and uh, Marcus Calisi in uh, in Munich. This talk uh, is also related to other talks at this conference. Uh, and in particular, the talk by Fotis and Maxime. And will be also related to the talk by Dieter Luz tomorrow at the other workshop, which is starting tomorrow. Okay, so the general motivation for this work can be 
we assumed in one question, which is how to understand quantum gravity. So this is a very general question. In particular, for this talk, I'm, uh, I'm uh, focusing on two approaches. The first one, which I call the top-down, is perhaps the most systematic one. So you start from uh, your 10-dimensional or 11-dimensional theory, so string theory or M theory, and then you just derive your favorite low energy physics. So this, I'm, I'm starting here the word derive because these are really a computation which in principle you should be able to do or you can do if your starting point is a good UV complete theory. However, this approach is uh, well known, it is art. And so there are many, perhaps only technical, but we don't know yet because we don't know string theory or M theory completely. So there are many obstructions in really pursuing this direction until the end. The other approach is what is called the bottom-up approach. And uh, this is essentially the standard effective field theory approach. But when we, we are doing quantum gravity, I would like to stress that standard effective field theory perhaps might not be enough. So the standard effective theory approach, perhaps when you're dealing with quantum gravity, could be uh, could require some more information, which I'm here calling educated guess. And so this talk will be essentially about this second alternative, so the bottom-up approach, and then try, I will try to explain a bit more, more in detail what this educated guess should be. So the, the, the educated guess, is actually the, the main, uh, um, the central uh, idea behind the Swampland program. So the presence of this educated guess. The Swampland program aims at answering the following question. So which EFTs, which looks consistent, are still consistent when you couple them to quantum gravity? And the surprising answer is that not all of them. So in some sense, the coupling to quantum gravity is predictive for your low energy effective theory. So I'm not going to review this one problem pro program. Uh, I will just briefly sketch in one slide uh, some logic behind. And in particular, I'm, I will try to uh, propose three steps in order to uh, apply this program. So in the first step, you analyze few well understood examples of theories with uh, effective field theories which are consistently coupled to quantum gravity. So typically you start, you derive this from string theory. And these are, unfortunately these are few at present. Well, these few theories, examples, you try to extract general properties. And then the crucial step is that you should be able to encode these properties into sharp statements which should be valid for any other consistent low energy effective field theory, which is coupled to quantum gravity. So here I'm using the word statement, but typically uh, you can call these also postulates if you want, depends on uh, your philosophy, but typically in the literature, these are called conjectures, so swamp and conjectures, because these are not proved, especially because still we don't really completely understand string theory or M theory. So to give you some examples, one of the most solid and well-tested Swampland conjecture is the absence of global symmetries in quantum gravity. Another well-tested Swampland conjecture, which I'm going to review a, a bit later, is the fact that gravity has to be the weakest force. So this is called the weak gravity conjecture. And that a more recent and the, perhaps a bit more speculative conjecture concerns the fate of the Sitter vacua. So it, it has been conjectured recently that the Sitter vacua might not be present in quantum gravity, uh, perhaps only in the metastable state they could be present, but let me say that, that this is still uh, a bit more speculative with respect to the other two, and we'll come back to this point later. Yes? Yes, there are proofs. Okay, yes, good point. So uh, when I'm saying there are no proofs, I'm saying that, I mean that there are no proofs in general in the whole string theory, but there are proofs for certain corners. For example, the no global symmetry has been proved in the uh, ADS-CFT. So in that context. But also from the okay, for the, yes, 
again, but for the full uh, string theory, we don't know, I would say. Yes. OK. And also, there is a, there is a recent paper on uh, proposing some proof for the weak gravity conjecture, I think it was last week or so, in, um, in Euclidean gravity. Yes, sorry, I'm not, I cannot really review all, all of these topics, so I will uh, perhaps uh, uh, suggest to follow or re, re see the, the talk by Elena Valenzuela. So, what is important for the rest is that the Swampen program is giving us a systematic tool. So, there is a systematic procedure to analyze low energy effective field theories. So, this is something which, in principle, was missing when you just look at your low energy effective field theory. And then we can apply this systematic procedure to study the, your favorite problem in, uh, in the low energy effective field theories. And in particular for this talk, I will study the presence of the sitter extrema. So in, I will not really concentrate on stability, just the presence of uh, uh, an extremum. And related to this, I will also uh, study effective field theories with a non-vanishing gravitational mass. So to motivate a bit more these two points, of course, the sitter is important phenomenologically because uh, today we, we measure uh, uh, positive, uh, small, but positive value for the dark energy density. And this could be explained as a positive cosmological constant. Of course, it is not the only explanation, but it's one possible explanation. It is well known, the sitter breaks supersymmetry. So from the technical or theoretical point of view, it is important to understand how to maintain control, even if supersymmetry is broken. And this is still an open problem, I would say. And as I was saying before, it has been conjectured that the sitter might not exist in some sense in quantum gravity or in certain regimes of uh, your quantum gravity. So there is a lot of work here. I cannot really review all of this. I'm just studying some of the recent people, uh, recent, uh, of the people which recently worked on this. But also, let me stress that there, are, that there are many proposals for the sitter construction in same theory, and perhaps the most studied and well understood one are KKLT and LVS, even though I will not really go into, into the details of them. So, the message that still the sitter, the fate of the sitter is an open problem, and this is why it's interesting to study the sitter. Then, the question for this talk is if it is possible to use the Swampern program to rule out the sitter, of course, without assuming the, the sitter, the non the sitter conjecture. So the question is, is it possible to use some other conjecture, which is more well tested and more robust, to be able to exclude the sitter vacuum in low energy effective field theories? Then I was talking about, I will be talking about the gravitino. So the gravitino is the spin tree of super partner of the graviton, so it's some ubiquitous mode in uh, supergravity and string theory. And in situations in which uh, your background energy is uh, small, like uh, at present in our universe, actually the gravitino mass gives us very important information on the supersymmetry breaking scale because there is some si a simple relation between them. So this could be interesting at present, again, to gain information on the scale uh, which supersymmetry is broken in our universe. So the question for this talk is what can we say in models where there is a non-vanishing gravitino mass and when I'm sending the gravitino mass uh, to zero uh, parametrically, essentially. So I will start now from the first uh, topic, so the sitter. And then I will show you how it is possible to use the weak gravity conjecture to exclude the sitter vacuum, and the sitter extrema in general. So just to review briefly the weak gravity conjecture, in one slide, uh, we consider a generic uh, four dimensional effective field theory coupled to a U1 gauge symmetry. So I have a standard Lagrangian with canonically normalized kinetic terms. And then I in particular recognize the, the gauge coupling here. Now there are two main versions of this conjecture, which, which are the electric one and the magnetic one. So in the electric version, this sharp statement is that there exists a particle with mass m and charge q and gauge coupling g, which has to obey this inequality, okay? But the one, the statement I'm going to use for the following is the magnetic one. So in the magnetic version of the Guigrandi conjecture, the sharp statement is that the cutoff of this 
four dimensional low energy effective field theory is bounded by the gauge coupling. So the moment I'm turning on a gauge coupling, I have an upper bound on, on my cutoff. So there is a simple argument now one can use with this information to exclude the sitter vacua. In the sitter, uh, there is a natural notion for IR cutoff, which is the upward scale. So this is an assumption I'm going to use. Now, I think it's fair to say that any good low energy effective field theory should have an hierarchy between its IR cutoff and UV cutoff, because otherwise there would be no room for the effective field theory to live in. Now, the second assumption is that if a given model has this particular property, so if the vacuum energy, the cosmological constant in this model is for some reason of the order of the gauge coupling, and here I mean that there is no other parameter I can tune in order to put an hierarchy between these two quantities. So these quantities are for some reason coupled. And then if the weak gravity conjecture holds, then you have, you have a contradiction because you don't have an hierarchy between the IR cutoff and the UE cutoff. Essentially because the IR cutoff, which is the upbold, is the assumption of the same order of the gauge coupling, which gives you some bound on the UV cutoff. So if this property happens, essentially, and if the weak gravity conjecture holds, then this is not a good low energy effective field theory in the sitter. It might still be a consistent application, but it's not a good low energy effective field theory. Now, so the question is, if this particular property happens in some model, some probably hopefully interesting model, and then I will uh, try to investigate models in supergravity, uh, of course, because we know that supergravity is uh, the consistent low energy limit of string theory. However, if you want to have simple models, so minimal supergravity, n equal one, typically in n equal one, you have too much freedom. And so uh, we, we were not really able to say, to say much due to this fact. Then we turn our attention to extended supersymmetry. And again, for simplicity, we look at n equal two. And in n equal two, it occurs that you really are able to, to say something non-trivial for these models. So what we have done, is that we analyze all known the sitter extrema in n equal to supergravity with only vector multiplets. So all the ones which are known in the literature are present. And we find that in all of them, that property that the Hubble scale is related to the gauge coupling holds. So there, are, there is no other parameter which is tunable once you correctly normalize all of your kinetic terms. So in, that, in, in these models, you have these contradiction between the hierarchy you would like to have in your effective field theory and the fact that the IR cutoff is actually given uh, quantized, uh, so is uh, given at the same order of the UE cutoff. And here there is a parameter Q, which is the gravitino charge, but we are assuming this to be quantized. So if you want this, the only extra information we are putting in uh, supergravity. So in this way, we were able to exclude all known the sitter extrema with, in models with only vector multiplets. And recently, there has been an extension to this work in models, including also others. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, that now all known models in n equal two with vectors and hyper are excluded because of this reason. We noticed also another fact that in all of these models where this problem occurred, if you look at the gravitino mass matrix, there is at least one zero eigenvalue. So the gravitino mass matrix is a two by two matrix in n equal two because we have two gravitini, and you will find that there is always at least one zero eigenvalue. So there seems to be, for some reason, a connection between M3 after, so the gravitino mass to be zero, and some Swamplan conjecture, and if you want the weak gravity conjecture. So this leads me to the second part of the talk, in which I will try to investigate this fact a bit more. In particular, we try to understand what happens when we send the gravity in mass to zero in four dimensional low energy effective field theory. So some related works on lower bounds on masses are the one in this slide. This is not a comprehensive review. So there are very well known lower bounds which come from unitarity. However, for the gravitino, these are not very useful 
because in the sitter, uh, this bound is uh, always severely satisfied. There is some related work by this group of people, which says that in four dimensional n equal one supergravity, the superpotential typically has to receive correction, so it cannot vanish unless there is a theory with a higher amount of supersymmetry, which is related to the original theory in a specific way. And this is related to the gravitational mass because the superpotential in n equal one is related to the gravitational mass by this relation. So if the superpotential cannot vanish, the gravitational mass cannot vanish in consistent low energy effective field theories. A related conjecture is the anti de Sitter distance conjecture because in supersymmetric anti de Sitter, the cosmological constant is exactly the gravitational mass. And this paper is proposing that you have problems when you send the cosmological constant to zero in anti, in anti de Sitter, supersymmetric anti de Sitter. And then there is this more recent bound proposed uh, by German Montero Van Riet, and also there is a, a follow up with Rafa, in which they propose a bound for all particles which are charged under IU1 symmetry in a, in a de Sitter space or in a positive energy background. So you will see that again, here you have some obstruction in taking the limit of the mass going to zero. So with all of this motivation in mind, what we propose is that the limit, the very limit of the gravitational mass going to zero is problematic for your low energy effective field theory. So if you want, this is a new uh, Zwamplan conjecture, which should be valid in any consistent low energy effective field theory. The reason why this limit is problematic is because there is a tower of states which, which mass, here I'm calling M tower, and this, tower, this mass will become parametrically light as soon as you send the gravitational mass to zero. Okay, so this is a generic statement, which means essentially that the gravitational mass is actually a parameter giving us information on the microscopic of our model. So, and I will uh, give you an example later on about this. Before going on, uh, let me stress that the same proposal was made almost at the same time, just one day later, by this group of people. So we have two independent works essentially proposing the, the same conjecture. So once you propose a conjecture, you should test it. This is what we have done. But of course, to test the conjecture, we have to make some assumptions. So here, if you want, the discussion becomes a bit less general. So to say something and to try to check this conjecture, we, we assume that there, there should be a simple relation of this type between the gravitational mass and the mass of the tower of states, with n is a model dependent parameter. So this might not be true in uh, particular models, but we have to assume something in order to continue. And then we check n equal one and n equal two models. If you want the motivation is that in n equal one, typically the gravitational mass and the gauge coupling are not related, while in n equal two they are related. And then we can try to relate our conjecture to other conjecture involved with the gauge coupling. Again, for example, or either the weak gravity conjecture or the absence of global symmetry. So in n equal one, uh, we did the following analysis, which is somehow generic for most of uh, known uh, com secondary compatification. So we parameterize the Keller potential and the super potential in terms of the volume of the compact manifold. And then also the kaluza klein scale is known to be parameterized by some power of the volume. So we have the volume relating all of these quantities. And then we can relate essentially the KK scale to the gravitational mass. So what happens is that we identified in these models the tower of states to be a tower of kaluza klein states. And again, the parameter n is model dependent. So this alpha and beta will depend on your model. So this is a list of examples we checked in and where the, the conjecture was working. I will not give you much details. Just if you want, there is also a com complementary list of examples in the paper by the, the, the other group. And recently, there is also some evidence for uh, string theory oriented for. Now, before finishing, uh, I would say a few words about n equal two. In n equal two, the situation is a bit more complicated. So the formulas of n equal two supergravity are, of course, more complicated than in n equal one. The mass matrix of the gravitino is of this type. So x here are the scalars of the, in the vector multiplex. But I would like you to focus on two quantities, this p lambda x and this e to the k half. So k is always the killer potential, and the killer potential will be generically the log of the volume. 
P lambda are what are called quaternionic prepotentials, and you can think of them as some sort of charges. In particular, they appear in the gravitino covalent derivative multiplying the vector. So if you want, they are related to the gravitino charge. This is not completely true because these are functions also of the scalar, so they have a bit more information. But still, if you turn on one of these quantities, then it means that you, the gravitino will be charged. And then you can calculate the gauge coupling. This is something we have done. So in the paper, we have the generic formula for the gauge coupling, which is schematically of the, this type. Again, notice that we have the Keller potential, which is the volume of the internal manifold related to the KK scale. And then we have a function of the scalars, which is a model dependent function. In the paper, we have the full formula. But anyway, this is the point in which you have to really specify your model to say something uh, uh, concrete. But what, what we observe is that both the gauge coupling and the gravitino mass depend on the Keller potential, and so they are related by this quantity, which is, again, the volume. So if you want, there, there is some hint of the following relation between the gravitino mass and the, the gauge coupling through the Keller potential. So it means that, we, in principle, we, we can connect the limit of gravitino mass going to zero with the limit of gauge coupling going to zero. So in principle, we can connect our conjecture on the vanishing gravitino mass to a much more tested conjecture, which is the absence of global symmetry. Then the simplest model probably you can do is this STU model. And in this case, actually, the, the correspondence between the two limits is one to one because the, this function here is just a constant. So you really have a precise one-to-one -one correspondence between these two conjectures in this model. So to conclude, in the first part I was uh, talking about the city of aqua. The city of aqua are interesting for phenomenological reasons at present. However, from a theoretical perspective, they, for some reason we don't understand, they are hard to construct. It has even been conjectured that they are impossible to construct. So I would say that this is an open problem, which makes the, the, their investigation interesting. And then we show that it is possible to exclude the sitter extrema in n equal to supergravity without assuming the sitter conjecture, but using some more robust Zwamplan conjecture, which is the weak gravity conjecture. And this analysis has also been extended recently. In the second part, I was talking about the gravitino. The gravitino is a peculiar fermion in, uh, in theories of supergravity and string theory. And we give evidence that its mass in the low energy effective field theory gives us very important information on the UV completion, in particular on the KK scale. So we proposed that the limit of vanishing gravity on mass is in fact problematic for your effective field theory, but there is a recent proposal and for sure more tests are needed. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nicola, for an interesting talk. I see there's a question. Thank you, Nicola. Um, I just first have a quick comment and then a question. The quick comment is uh, this last thing you said about n equal two and um, the link with global symmetries is very interesting. And I just wanted to add that in n equal one, you actually have the same, right? So. Um, as pointed out by Cyborg and Komargotsky, when you have constant uh, Fi terms, mm. um, this is typically what you need to get to sitter. Yes. And then in those models, they, have, they claim that you always uh, have global symmetries. You're imposing global symmetries on quantum gravity to do this consistently. And at the same time, the gravitino is charged in these, these models and exactly as a zero uh, yes, mass. Yes. So I just want to point out, I mean, it makes, it's, it's quite striking how these things uh, talk to each other. So, and then my comment is, I mean, in light of what has happened this year, um, concerning the groups that found like really small W not values, say for KKLT, right? I mean, if I understood, they even get to 10 to the minus 10 in string units. Would you say that this implies they're sort of overlooking light modes? Ah, no, 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 uh, no. So my my way my my way of thinking about this is rather the opposite. So their construction is what, in the introduction, I was calling uh, uh, 
it doesn't work anymore. Anyway, in their construction, I was calling the top-down approach. So they and versus the bottom up. So I would say that they are following a top-down approach, and then they are finding uh, the they propose this construction in order to have extremely uh, small W naught. And I would say that at least my point of view is that the Zwoplan program is the reverse. So you start from the bottom up and you try with some sort of genericity argument, if you want, to say that in general there should be a problem in, uh, for example, in the limit of uh, vanishing gravity in a mass. So what I, I think that you can uh, make these two statements compatible uh, in the sense that uh, we are not saying that 10 to the minus 10 is, is, uh, is wrong and you maybe you have to stop at 10 to minus 8. We are saying that you cannot go parametrically close to zero, essentially. So I don't know where the bound uh, uh, should be put. And I don't know if it is possible even to give an estimation of this. So, um, so but you're saying it's not parametric and therefore it doesn't fall into the... Exactly. OK, thank you. Yeah. Don't think we have online okay. questions, or do we? So thanks for the talk. So when you do like uh, when you work into this bottom up approach, but when you do top down, and then you do quantifications and so on, down to n equals to two for gravities, typically you end up in models of n equals to two with hyper multiplets and with regions in the hyper multiplet sector. And they contain many more parameters specifying the gradient. In that case, the vanity analysis is not in one to one correspondence with the gauge coupling because there is all these other parameters and the gauge coupling sort of overall thing. So, in the case of having hyper multiplex, which is the most common case, we expect also to have to be able to make like general statements as to the minimum. Sorry, uh, be able to, to do? General statement. Like ah, uh, oh no, okay. Uh, so, the, the first question is that I don't know. Uh, as I was saying, the situation becomes model dependent. So there is this function of f, which depends on the scalars of the vector multiples and of the hyper multiples. So here, you have, there you have the, the information. Okay. So that uh, you are the vector multiple scalar, and you are the the, um, the hypers. So from here, I cannot say anything more generic. I have to look at examples, and then uh, you're right. Uh, the situation, the typical situation is when you have hypers. So in this paper, for simplicity, we started from vectors, just for simplicity, there was no other criterion. But with hypers, the situation indeed uh, becomes more complicated. But then I would uh, suggest maybe to look at the, the recent paper by the other group, uh, which I don't, ah, this one, in which they consider hypers. So in this paper, here they consider hypers. So there, they are running exactly the same argument I'm oh, no, sorry. Uh, okay, no. Um, yes, so here they consider hypers, and then you can try to run the same argument. You can calculate the same gauge coupling, and then you should be able to see. But I, I, don't, I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't remember if they have done exactly these steps. But in principle, this is something you can do in your models and check. But a generic statement, I don't, I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, because I, I, I think it's more, rather than considering hyper which uh, is something you, I think it's important. Also considering more parameters yes. associated to the way you gauge. I yes. 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 Because yes. then the gravity and the gauge coupling will not be one to one. And I don't know if all these statements about correlation of different scales will hold. Them. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. That's uh, the weak point, if you want, in this, uh, in this part. So we check just a simple STU model, and there was this one to one, but it's not, uh, it's fair from being realistic. It's far from being realistic. Thank you. Thank you. I guess in view of the time, let's postpone further questions to the coffee break. And um, I would like to ask everybody to be uh, punctual so that we can maybe even start a few minutes early. Thank, Thank you, Nicolo. Thank you. Thank you.